This lecture tracks Joan's life from the solid context of her native village of Domremy on the eastern frontier of France to the royal court of Chinon in the Loire Valley at the heart of the kingdom. There she told the Dauphin Charles a secret which convinced him of her authenticity and of her mission to save him. The transcript of her second trial, her trial at Rouen in 1456, that is long after she was dead, is rich in village testimony about her early life. It's very startling or, startlingly ordinary, the story of her early life. But at 13, we're told, Joan began to hear angelic, heavenly voices. And at 16, she dedicated herself to virginity in view of the mission which she now saw as hers, to save the embattled Dauphin and to get him crowned king. Persuading sensible adults to let her try to do this was, of course, immensely difficult. Perhaps Joan's first miracle was to persuade her family and Robert de Baudricourt to send her to the Dauphin. What was the secret she revealed to him? Let's see if we can make our way to that point. Joan's sense of mission began quite early in her young life, in her pre-adolescent years, it would seem. In adolescence, or perhaps in pre-adolescence, Joan developed a really unusual personal spirituality. By the time she was 13, she later told her trial judges, she began to hear voices, the voices of angels, she was sure. Now, the timing of this experience in her life has led several modern scholars of the Middle Ages to speculate that it had something more to do with hormones than with God. Joan never fully developed normal adolescent female sexuality, they say, and she was therefore never fully a woman. This assumption has recommended itself to several modern writers and artists. Joan of Arc, in their eyes, was lean, tight-bodied, a hoyden, well-tanned on face and arms, practically breastless. There is, unfortunately, no contemporary evidence for this image of her. The Duke of Alençon, in fact, was given to remarking how beautiful her breasts were. And her English jailers in Rouen appreciated, they said, her buttocks. Sometimes when on campaign, she may not have menstruated, which also happens to quite many female soldiers in today's armies. But it's very unlikely that we should not think about Joan as a real full woman in the senses of physical maturing. It's most unlikely that such notions would ever have occurred to Joan's contemporaries, some of whom remarked what a womanly young woman she was, despite her manly behavior on campaign, despite the practical men's clothes that she wore at such times, but not at others. She was very fond of her red dress. And furthermore, we have little evidence that she had a short haircut until the time of the trial. For her medieval contemporaries, the issue would have been different. What were the sources of her voices? Not whether she heard them, but where did they come from? Were these the voices from God, or were they voices from the devil? Since these voices first spoke to her in her father's garden, a secure and happy place, Joan was sure that they were the voices of angels coming from God. After much prayer, and probable consultation with her parish priest, she was convinced that these were good and holy voices, to which were soon added the voices of St. Catherine of Alexandria and St. Margaret of Antioch, two mythic virgin martyrs of the heroic days of the early church. They also, by the way, happened to be saints whose visages could be seen in her local church. What did these voices tell her? To reconstruct her later statements, they told her to go save France, relieve Orléans, and get the Dauphin Charles, the Valois claimant to the French throne, crowned 
at Raz. That was a very tall order for a little peasant girl. Professor Charles Wood of Dartmouth College suggested that her mission was originally only to save the Dauphin, and only later, after she had done so by relieving the siege of Orléans, only then did she become convinced that her mission included getting Charles crowned. That is, Charles Wood maps out in sequence the different missions that Joan adopted as ones that her spirits had mandated. At 16, Joan dedicated herself to virginity. It's important that we recognize that she did not say that she was dedicating herself to virginity for her whole life. She was dedicating herself to virginity until her mission was accomplished. It was not that she said, and then I'll go off and get married and have many children, but she never denied the possibility that she might go off then and marry and have children. Her virginity was therefore part of her task and a, a means of achieving her goal. And she was very clear about why she wanted to maintain her, her virginity, because she saw that as the necessary means of saving France by rescuing the Dauphin, which could only be done by a virgin who came from the frontiers of his land, according to the earlier myths. Her chief title during her military activity was Jean la Pucelle, or Joan the Maid, Joan the Virgin. In medieval Europe, virginity was a normal condition of life for anyone, male or female, with such a special, totally demanding vocation. Lack of demonstrable virginity would have been a strong indication to Joan's supporters that she was a fraud if she weren't a witch. So her virginity, her wholeness of body, had to be there to demonstrate the wholeness of her mind. Because if her body was in any way fractured, had it been opened, it would be a sign also that her mind might be fractured or open to influences that came from sources other than that those of God. Around this same time that she discovered her own world of vir virgin cause, she also successfully defended herself in an ecclesiastical trial in the nearby diocese of Toul against a young man whose name we don't know who claimed that she was pledged to him in marriage. This is one of those strange little parts of Joan's life which is quite remarkable and about which one is desperate for more information. Joan confessed at one time that this was the time she had disobeyed her parents. Of course, going to Domremy, leaving Domremy to go find the Dauphin was against their wishes, but she saw God's will in that matter as entirely overriding her parents' authority or command. But the suitor's name, as I said, has not survived in the surviving records. And it seems as though Joan was rejecting a betrothal that may have been arranged by her parents, which would be entirely conventional in that kind of peasant village. And so she became a defendant in a breach of promise suit when she refused to marry the young man. She claimed consistently, consistently, that she had not made any man any such promise. And she won. What's most remarkable about this is that she defended her own cause in the court, and she won. Having failed to have made the promise, she could not be accused of breach of promise. Her poor parents, they were desperately worried about their eldest daughter's wild ideas. Her respectable father particularly worried about her safety. Jacques went so far as to tell her sons, his sons, her, her brothers, that if their sister went off with soldiers, he had had a dream in which he saw Joan going off with soldiers. He said to his sons, if she goes off with soldiers, drown her, because he was sure that what that could mean was only that she would become a camp follower, as military prostitutes were called in those times. 
The marriage to the boy from Tool, or the boy mentioned in Tool, must have seemed to have her parents to have been a perfect solution for Joan's wild ideas in her youth. Also remember that Domremy was an outpost of French, that is Valois, or more popularly Armagnac, loyalty in a predominantly Burgundian region. In July of 1428, Domremy had been evacuated before being sacked by the Burgundian troops. Domremy's name itself may suggest, although this has been challenged by contemporary scholars, that the community itself remembered some sort of dependency upon the great church of Saint Remy, Saint Remy at Reims, where the kings of France had always been crowned. Domremy's protective feudal superior was Don Jean de Joinville, the heiress of a family long famous for its loyalty to the Counts of Champagne and the kings of France. In fact, the king of France had also been the Count of Champagne since 1314 and the Joinville family preferred the Valois, that is the French, to the Plantagenet or Burgundian descendants of the old Capetian dynasty. Dame Jean stayed close to this village's concerns. In 1425, she had made a cattle thief return Domremy's raided cattle. In any case, our young Joan then had to convince the practical adult world of her very improbable mission that she was sent by God to raise the Dauphin to the status of king. Her first step was to get not just permission, but a military escort from the local military commander, the embattled French pro Robert de Baudricourt. Her father dealt with Baudricourt regularly as mayor of Domremy, but he resisted Joan's plea that he intercede on her behalf. He wished his daughter to have nothing to do with that larger military world. Joan began with the help of an uncle in May of 1428, when she was 16 years old. She began trying to convince Baudricourt of her mission. She went to the fortified town of Vaucouleur, which he commanded. Not surprisingly, he dismissed her and said, go home. Baudricourt seems to have been a bluff old soldier. Like Jean de Joinville, he was and remained a faithful partisan of the French Dauphin Charles, whom he had not only served but knew personally. Joan's declaration of her mission must have seemed like utter nonsense to him, a kind of nonsense for which he as a very hard-boiled military man, had no time at all as he watched one after another of the great defenses of France being stripped away. And Baudricourt was pressed for time and for resources. Vaucouleur was a French holdout in a region that has largely gone over to the other side, to the English side of the Duke of Burgundy, and Burgundy was very clear he wanted to secure Vaucouleur as a corridor connecting the traditional core of Burgundy to the south with his richest northern provinces in Flanders and the Low Countries, what is now much of northern France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. That connection would have given him enormous power over the, he expected, coming English dynasty. In spite of the logic of the Duke of Burgundy's desire and Robert de Baudricourt's reasonable reluctance to give her any place at all, Joan's persistence kept her attempting the impossible. In January of 1429, Joan got her very favorite older male cousin, Durand Laxart, to take her again to see Baudricourt in Vaucouleur. Baudricourt rebuffed Joan again. He sent her off to see Duke Charles of Lorraine, a large duchy to the east of the French Champagne, which the Dukes of Burgundy had been trying to turn into a kingdom for themselves. Charles was a weary old womanizer, reaching the end of his life, sick, worried, rather desperate, some 
for some miraculous reassurance about his chances of salvation. Joan of Arc disapproved of him mightily, and she upbraided him absolutely for his sins and promised him nothing. However, this impressed Charles rather than depressed him. When she returned to Vaucalore from Nancy, the capital of Lorraine, Joan somehow convinced Baudricourt to send her to the Dauphin in Chinon with a letter of introduction and a small escort of men. This must have been a moment that seemed to her to be a miracle. She, who had been trying so hard to do something useful for her Dauphin, was kept even from the presence of the Dauphin. How could a poor peasant girl get there without really very good letters of introduction? After her earlier rebuff, Joan had started out from for Chinon with two or three quite unmilitary family members, but quickly realized that this was not the way to go. What persuaded Baudricourt to give her and her mission a chance? Something must have convinced him that there was more to her than mere stubbornness. Inappropriately disobedient though she was, there must have been something about the demeanor of this virgin girl. Perhaps he figured he had nothing to lose by getting rid of this importunate peasant. But we do know that the villagers of Vaucouleur were themselves convinced of Joan's mission. And it may have cost Robert de Baudricourt a good deal less to send Joan on her way with a little assistance than it would be to turn her down and face the local consequences, if not the global ones. He did write her a letter of recommendation to the Dauphin, if only we had it. And that must have been a great credibility risk for him. How do you write seeing, dear Dauphin, I'm sending you a peasant girl who says that she is going to be able to lift the siege of Orléans, thereby assuring that you will become king. I'm sure she'll be able to do it. Do take her seriously. Would the Dauphin ever take him seriously again? Would he become a laughing stock because he had sent the girl along? He must have seen something very special and even heroic in the young Joan. This little troop of Joan and the men de Baudricourt assigned to her covered over 200 miles in 11 days from the 22nd of February to the 2nd of March of 1429 traveling almost entirely by night to avoid enemy soldiers. They even avoided going to mass, with one exception when they blended incognito into a Friday mass in the Auxerre Cathedral. For the devout Joan who liked to go to mass frequently, an unusual thing for anyone of any class of her day, this was a real hardship. The next step was to go to see the Dauphin. She arrived with her little corps of men. We already know that Charles was somewhat paranoid by nature. He had good reason to be so. He had had several serious accidents, and he was convinced that the Duke of Burgundy, as well as the English regent, the Duke of Bedford, wanted to assassinate him. Were Charles assassinated, it would take care of all the problems, because Charles was not the eldest son who would be leaving many younger brothers beneath him who could take over the role of Dauphin. He was the last survivor. All of his older brothers had died. His sister was married to Henry, who would then become king, uh, who, would, who would become king of England and, and of uh, France, he thought, and whose young son Henry was going to be king of both, Henry VI would be king of both France and England together. There was good reason, therefore, for Charles to think he could be assassinated, and no reason not to think that this strange girl with her bizarre story wouldn't be a means of achieving that end. Without a letter of introduction from the loyal and sensible Baudricourt, it's hard to imagine that Charles would have consented to see this bizarre peasant girl. But having agreed to see her during a daytime session of open court with perhaps 300 courtiers in attendance, 
he decided to test her by hiding among the courtiers. And all movie makers who have done the story of Joan of Arc love to show this scene because there we imagine the whole court assembled, large numbers of people, many different kinds of activities taking place in this large open hall as would be typical in any kind of court when it is in session. Formal things would be happening in one corner, people gossiping in another, playing games in one other, and, and, and uh, writing in, in yet another. We can imagine a huge variety of activities taking place in this space. How in this space, if the Dauphin is not sitting on his throne, was Joan to recognize him? How did Joan pass that cunning test? What Charles did and what the record attests is that he had someone else, some other courtier who remains unnamed, sit on the throne. And he himself merged with the crowd. Imagine that moment. Imagine being a child who has never seen a major court in action, who has never seen a room as splendid, never seen people as magnificently dressed, never seen such variety and color any place in her life who has just come from a long, grinding travel in order to get to her heart's fulfillment in the sight of the Dauphin. She ignored the courtier who was dressed up in kingly clothes, and she went straight for the disguised Dauphin and knelt before him and said, My Lord, how did she recognize him? There are a couple of theories. Some people believe in what's called the royal bastard theory of Joan of Arc's story and say that it wasn't that she recognized him out of nowhere. She already knew him, they say. It was prearranged. According to the usual form of this theory, Joan was Charles's half-sister, the child of Queen Isabeau, his mother, and Duke Louis of Orléans. She had been sent for raising to the loyal peasant family of the Darks, and uh, who were also friends of Jean of Joinville's and on her lands. And she had been prepared to make a dramatic intervention when time was right. So she was raised for this moment, it is said. Even if she had not actually seen Charles before, the theory goes, she was told of some sign that would let him know who she was, and vice versa. So instead of there being a secret and simply a moment of recognition, the old theory of the royal bastard says that it was instead an intervention timed like a play in order to reinforce Charles's, Charles's own legitimacy in the eyes of the court there present. What, in any case, was the secret, she told him. Some say she reassured him that he was, in fact, his father's son, that he was the son of Charles VI, not of Louis of Orléans or some other lover of Queen Isabel's. But that exaggerates a propaganda rumor circulated by her enemies only later. And the bastardly theory is, in any case, unsupported by any sort of reasonable evidence of which I know. And none of the major contemporary scholars of Joan of Arc give it credence, not Regine Pernou or Marie Veronique Klein or other contemporary scholars. In fact, Marie Veronique Klein has recently published a scholarly biography of Isabeau, which rejects all the slanders about her infidelity. So what we have is this remarkable scene in which we have Joan coming to the court at Chinon, facing Charles in all of the glamour of Charles's situation, and asking Charles to speak with him privately. When Charles allows her to speak with him privately, takes her into an anteroom to speak alone with her, the court is shocked. They're shocked first that she seemed to know who the Dauphin was, and secondly, that she said that she brought him a message and needed to tell him a secret. Many are the filmmakers and scholars who would like to have been in that ante room at that time to know exactly what the secret was that Joan told Charles the Dauphin. 
At her trial, it is a question to which all of her inquisitors, her judges, return over and over again. What did you tell Charles? And what is Joan's answer? Joan's answer is consistent throughout her life. Ask the king. If you wish to know, ask the king. I told him I was a messenger from God. Beyond that, I will not say. Could it be that she reaffirmed to him his authenticity as a legitimate son? It might well be. In spite of the fact that the rumors are ones that abounded, as far as we can tell, long after the lifetime of Isabel and certainly were English in origin, nevertheless, the fact that his father was a madman must have given Charles pause about whether he was either legitimate or sane and whether his cause was true. When we think about the story of his father, Charles, we want to return to that moment which made the decisive difference in the Hundred Years' War and in the destiny of France and England. That moment when Charles, who was sick, many people think he was schizophrenic, he certainly was subject to all sorts of fits and diseases, after the loss of the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, when the kingdom was in disarray, was convinced by his courtiers and by his queen that the most reasonable resolution that would give France the best chance of maintaining itself as a nation and of getting this horrible war to stop, of being able to bring peace to a nation that at that point had been at war for a very long time, was to marry his daughter, Catherine, to Henry V of England. That marriage, he thought, was going to guarantee the peace of the people and the combination, the combining of the two dynasties so that their children would be able to be the appropriate heirs. Henry and Catherine did have a child, Henry. And in spite of that, however, the French were not satisfied that their male line, the male line that was so important to them, for instance, with Louis the Seventh and uh, the insistence that, that he be king and can maintain control over Eleanor of Aquitaine, that that French line persist, and that it persist as a male line of power. It was that determination on a male line of power that we find Joan of Arc agreeing with. Wouldn't we think it more credible to think that a young girl would find it appealing, that peace would come about because of the marriage of two powers, of the powers of the French, the powers of the English, coming together in order to bring, out a bring forth a child who would be able to be gloriously the best of both cultures, all of whom came from one line of blood descent. Why did it matter so much to Joan that it be the Dauphin? Joan had a very conservative streak in terms of her sense of the monarchy. She wanted no English king. And however we, looking back on it, see that these were all simply families that were interwoven for generation after generation. For Joan, they were simply distinct. And she wanted to make sure that her king would rule her country. About this matter, she had great clarity. The French nobles may have worried back and forth about whether they were putting their cousins in jail or killing off one branch of the family tree. The popes and the clergy were all worried about who was the legitimate pope. All of these terribly confusing issues faced the people and the learned in that day. Joan was very clear. Her Dauphin was to become her king. And that king could only be crowned in one place, the ancient place of the kings of France in Reims. And before that could happen, the city of Orléans would need to be taken. And before that could happen, her Dauphin would have to accept her as the virgin who was sent by God 
through her voices to save France.